I want to welcome everybody back for one of my favorite messages, one of the clearest teachings in all of the Bible. We're going to be studying Daniel 7 tonight, and you could call Daniel 7 the sequel to Daniel 2. Daniel 2, you heard the previous meeting with Dr. Tim laying out the teaching from a dream given to an ancient king called Nebuchadnezzar in the court of Babylon, interpreted by a young man, a godly Jew named Daniel. And he dreamed that dream that there was a head of gold and then arms of silver, chest of silver, belly and thighs of bronze and legs of iron, followed by feet of iron and clay. And what was so amazing about this vision, about this statue, is that Nebuchadnezzar, at the time of his reign and rule, he's going he's gonna to have his mind on the idea that he, he will reign forever. Babylon, the whole earth was prostrate at Babylon's feet. Babylon, this is the city of my, the delight of my eyes, which I have glorified. May it last forever. It was the wealthiest kingdom of antiquity. Nobody expected Babylon, as you heard Friday night, to be conquered. So Daniel is really sticking his neck out to share what the Lord told him. And what was it? He said, Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom, you are this head of gold, but after you will come another. Cyrus the Great, the Persians under the city with the river. By the way, did you know that that is named specifically in the book of Isaiah? God says, my servant Cyrus. He names him by name. And it will be said, dry up the rivers and that he will the Persians will send their people, God's people, back to their land. So that was prophesied elsewhere where Cyrus is named before he was born. That's how amazing Bible prophecy is. Um, that's Isaiah 44, verses 27 and 28, if you want to study that further. But this is just a little review from Friday night. Did the Persians last forever? Did they reign forever? No, of course. Alexander the Great, the faster, fastest conqueror in the history of ancient empires, conquered the empire for Greece, followed by Rome. So you study this in great depth with amazing historical detail on Friday, which I highly appreciate. And I want to add something here, though, and that is how astounding it is that in Daniel 2, not only was Daniel able to say, Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to be succeeded by another empire, but after that one will be another one, and after that one, another one. How does he know? And, and if he would say that, wouldn't he say, after that, another one's going to conquer? And after that, another one's going to conquer. How does he know to stop at the fourth one? And then in Daniel 2, to say, that one will not be conquered, but will be what? What was the D word that he used? It will be divided. How did Daniel know that the fourth kingdom in succession would not be conquered, but would be divided? Isn't that exactly what happened to the Roman Empire? How many was it divided into, students from last Friday? It was divided into ten, as you know. And then, so Daniel's, not Daniel, may I correct the language here? The Lord giving the truth to Daniel, because Daniel disclaims that. He says, there's no wisdom in me. This is from God. He's able to say, you aren't going to last forever. There's going to be another one after you, and then another, and then another. That one won't be conquered, but will be divided. And then he even specifically says that there will be efforts to unite, but as iron and clay don't mix, these will not cleave, they will not mix, and they will even attempt to mingle the seed of men, attempt through intermarriage to unite Europe, so through conquest, you heard about Hitler and Napoleon and Charlemagne and, and Kaiser Wilhelm and, and Tsar, all of these people. But then the grandmother of Europe, as she was called, Queen Victoria, had 40 children intermarrying the bloodlines across Europe. You saw the family tree. Did it succeed in uniting Europe as a reunited Roman Empire, all these intermarriages? It did not, exactly as the prophecy said. It said they will attempt to unite by mingling the seed of men, but they will not cleave. He's, Daniel is foretelling history a thousand years, two thousand years ahead of his time. This is Bible prophecy. So um, there are current attempts, of course. You've heard of the European Union. Have you heard of Brexit? Did that make anybody go, yeah, I was kind of expecting something like that, that this wouldn't continue down the path 
of unification. When I taught political science, we discussed the, the hypothetical or fictional scenario of a United States of Europe, a truly one nation that is Europe. That is not what they are today even, especially with Brexit. But it's what they're attempting to do. I found this to be an interesting graphic I thought I'd share with you to piggyback on Friday's message. Do you know what that building is? That's the European Parliament building. And she said it looks like the Tower of Babel. It sure does. Uh, an uncanny resemblance to the Renaissance era famous iconography of that Tower of Babel image. You put one next to the other and you go, I think those Eurocrats might be trying to communicate something here. Because what was the Tower of Babel? It was the dividing of the nations, was it not? And the European Union is an attempt to reunite the nations of Europe as a reunited Roman Empire. Now, the cool thing about this prophecy is it ends with the rock that was cut out of the mountain how? Do you remember? Without human hands, so divine action. And that rock hits the statue at the feet and all the kingdoms of this world, which the Apostle Paul says are coming to nothing, will be blown away like chaff. And then that rock will become a mountain that fills the whole earth. That's Christ's kingdom, which we pray for in the Lord's Prayer, do we not? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That will be a truly new and real world order, not a globalist agenda of a European Union, a World Economic Forum vision of a new world order. It's going to be the real deal, a whole new order God will establish with peace and with victory over the serpent. So tonight's message in our Bible prophecy seminar for such a time as this is called Antichrist Power Rising. Now, the Antichrist goes by many names in the Bible. The man of sin, the little horn, the lawless one, the beast power of Revelation 13, and of course, Antichrist. And if we want to not be deceived, we want to receive a love of the truth. So are we prepared? Let's prepare ourselves in prayer. Are we prepared to see in God's word whatever the truth may be, even if it is, is, is difficult to, to accept. I'll tell you tonight is the first time I studied this and saw this as clearly from the Bible as you will see tonight. It, was, it challenged my preconceived ideas. And I want to say also that when we get to that point, I want it to be so clearly the Bible's teaching, not any man's interpretation, that I want you, when we get to that point, to tell me what this power is. Don't say it yet if you already know. But when we get to it, let's allow each identifier of the Antichrist power reveal itself tonight so that we can walk away knowing for sure. And then we don't have any fear because we know we have Jesus Christ, not Antichrist. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for Jesus who is the truth. We know he has a counterfeit. And we want to understand how deceptive that is, how how it's capturing the minds of many, and we want to be freed from that, that we might walk with Jesus as Enoch did and be prepared to go to heaven when Jesus returns, just like Enoch did. May we hear your voice, your, your grace and truth in their fullness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know what the word antichrist means? Strong's Concordance, Antichrist, either one who puts himself in the place of or the enemy or opponent of Messiah. Most people just think anti, like the enemy. But I underlined the operative portion there also. In the place of. So Antichrist won't be some sinister secular figure by this definition. He will be a figure that has a Christian veneer. He's in the place of Christ. John, uh, do you remember in 2 Thessalonians 2, the other night we saw this word, son of perdition, that phrase, son of perdition. It says, he, the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be like the son of perdition. You can find that phrase in the Bible one other place. It's in the book of John. Do you know who it refers to? Judas. It refers to Judas Iscariot. So the Antichrist will be like a Judas was Judas within the fold of the disciples of Jesus? He was. 
So in the place of and within, also in 2 Thessalonians, it says he will set himself within the very temple of God. Again, this is internal stuff. The apostle also refers to it as the falling away or the great apostasy. He says these are ones that went out from us but are not of us. This is in the book of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John where we get the word antichrist from. That's the only place you'll find the, the term antichrist is in John's epistles. But our main study tonight is Daniel 7. This one will reveal so clearly the entity. I just wanted to have a little primer so you understand what that word means and some of the biblical context of it so we're not looking out in the future after a secret rapture during seven years of, of life on earth that continues after that for a you know, United Nations general assembly or something in a secular realm of, of that nature. It's going to have a religious deception to it. Daniel 7, let's start in verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great, what's the next word there? Beasts came up from the sea, each different from each, the other. Now, what I appreciate so much about the Bible is it doesn't leave us in doubt as to what it means when it uses symbolic language. Daniel's having a dream about beasts, and we can see in verse 23 what beasts represent in this dream. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom upon the earth. And in verse 17, same thing. The, those great beasts, which are four, are, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. So beasts in Bible prophecy represent kingdoms or kings in Daniel 7. We'll see it again in Revelation 13. Let's read on in verse 3. Those four beasts came up, each different from the other. And verse 4, the first was like a what? It was like a lion. And the lion had eagle's wings. Now, you're going to notice something as we go through Daniel 7. You're going to say, this feels like review. Did you ever take a math class where in order to learn a new math lesson, you had to review the free previous one first? Uh, Dr. Tim had a fancy name for this. I, I call it a repeat and enlarge. I forgot what terminology he used. It was, uh, it was a, little more, uh, a little more flowery than that. But do you remember it? Exhortation. Yeah, exhortation. He'll, he'll set me right after the, after the meeting. But you're going to feel like this is familiar. There are going to be how many kingdoms? Four, the first one is like a lion. Now, a lion, this is the national symbol of, guess which of the four ancient kingdoms? Babylon, the first, the head of gold. Now, suspend judgment on it because you want to see that it all fits. But so far, it's looking like a parallel, isn't it? This is the Ishtar Gate, by the way, at um, the British History Museum where they've excavated ancient Babylon and they show lions marking the way on the processional path toward the center of the city. And not just that, but listen to the rest of verse 4. I watched till its wings were plucked off. Uh, have, you, have you heard of a story, maybe in the book of Daniel, where a king who had a kingdom had his wings plucked, metaphorically speaking here? Do you know the story of Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah. What did he do after he saw the statue of the four metals? He erected a statue of just gold. He was prideful. He said, worship me. And God humbled him. God said, you're going to be a wild man and lose your mind and eat grass like an ox and live with the dew and have long claws for fingernails and lose your mind for seven years. And then he humbled himself and he said, God raises up kings and he deposes them. And he became a believer in the God of Daniel. So let's read the rest of the verse. He had his wings plucked for a time, but the rest of the verse says, and he was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a what? Like a man. He was... So he's no longer beast-like in the forest. And a man's heart was given to him. 
A new heart also will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. This is conversion that is describing. This is an actual ruler who is given a real man's heart. Kingdoms of this world are often so beastly, domineering, conquistadors. In this case, he is a converted man. Verse 5. So I think we can start our list there before we go to verse 5. Place Babylon as the first next to Babylon. Let's see if it all lines up. Verse 5, and suddenly another beast, does that kind of sound like Daniel 2? After you will come another kingdom. You notice how these are contiguous. Did you notice how the statue is all one timeline? It's not like there's this and maybe a thousand years later it'll be that and who knows when after that it'll be that. No, it's, it's, a, it's after you will come another kingdom and then after that another and then after that another and that one won't be conquered but divided. We'll see what happens here. He says, I saw suddenly another beast, suddenly a second one, like a bear. Now, we've got to be careful because we might just be tempted to go, a bear, this is Mother Russia, because that's the symbol of Russia. <laughs> well, did Russia come right after Babylon in the succession of empires? It, it did not. But this bear actually fits perfectly with something else because what it says about the bear is it was raised up on one side. Do you know of a kingdom, the only kingdom that succeeded the Babylonian Empire. Do you know of a kingdom that had two elements to it? The Medes and the Persians, the Medo-Persian Empire, one of which was stronger. Who was Cyrus the Great of? The Medes or the Persians? The Persians had greater power. And so this bear has is raised up on one side. So one side is more prominent than the other. And it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. Well, that's pretty interesting because this kingdom, the Medo-Persian Empire, conquered guess how many nations in its rise to power. The Medo-Persian Empire conquered Egypt and Lydia and Babylon in order to become the next empire. And it says, Arise, devour much flesh. So another conquering kingdom in succession. Now, the third one. After this, I looked, this is verse 6, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. Pause right there. Can you think of a faster animal in their um, ecosystem than the leopard? And it's given wings on top of that. So this denotes immense speed of conquest. Who was the fastest conqueror in the history of the ancient empires? Alexander the Great of Greece. Now it also says that this beast had four heads and the dominion was given to it. So it's like once it had its imperial conquest in its dominion, it had four heads. Do you know your history at all? That's pretty interesting. Not only did Alexander the Great conquer very fast, but his reign was very short. He died at a young age, and he did not consolidate the empire, but on his deathbed they asked him, who shall the empire go to? And what did he say, do you know? The to the strongest. And how many generals did he just so happen to have that carved up the Greek empire into the four major sections of the Greek empire. They're named on the screen with their rough boundaries labeled with their individual colors. Pretty neat, huh? Yeah. Daniel wouldn't have known. <laughs> it, Greece, did, by the way, Greece is named by name in Daniel chapter 8. I don't think that was mentioned Friday. That's huge. I almost forgot to say it. That is huge. We're not going to do that whole study of Daniel 8. It's a good one. In a condensed series like this, you can put it on the docket for doing after the series and subsequent studies together. But I'll tell you, Daniel names Greece. It's called Grecia in the King James, and which is like making a prediction. If I were to be like, I see the nation of Peru becoming the great Western imperial nation in the next decade. What? Peru? They're not really going to conquer anybody. They're nice people. They're just a little country down there. But 
that's what Greece was at the time. Greece was not imperial in their abilities. But Daniel names them as they're coming next. And Isaiah names Cyrus. Before the captivity, before the Jews were taken away even by the Babylonians, this is before Persia was in the picture at all, Cyrus was named. Pretty amazing prophecies. Greece. By the way, didn't you appreciate Friday night how it's like Daniel is so unbelievably accurate that you have to cook up a theory that it was fraudulently written much later and purports to be written before the events because the events are predicted so perfectly. It must be a historical account claiming to be, fraudulently claiming to be ancient. And how was that disproven? The Dead Sea Scrolls. They find these scrolls in a cave in Israel and they date to hundreds of years before Christ. And you read Daniel, much of Daniel, right out of there, word for word, as in your Daniel. And they, they had been degraded a lot, but you have enough there to go on that you know this was legit. All right, let's go to the fourth beast. I don't know how to artistically portray that. I've seen it a hundred different ways, but the terrible beast. Let's read it in verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge, what kind of teeth? Thank you, Dr. Tim. The iron legs, iron teeth. You're seeing these match up. The fourth one matches with the fourth one. Just by that iron there is our cue. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. Now pause right there. We're putting Rome there, the long legs of iron, the longest reigning kingdom, the iron monarchy of Rome, as it's been known, had the most power of them all. Babylon had the most wealth of them all. Did you notice that the value of the metals goes down from gold to silver to bronze to iron in terms of precious metals? The value is going down, but the strength is increasing. And that's exactly how history transpired. I mean, not that Rome wasn't wealthy, but it didn't have Babylon's gold. Gold was as common as dust, they said, in the city. But um, Rome here, we're going to go to the rest of it now because Daniel continues the story with a very interesting detail that you would expect from Daniel 2 in the statue. It says, and it had ten horns. Do you know of another vision in Daniel where there was a kingdom followed by ten? You studied this on Friday. It was the ten toes in the feet of partly iron, partly clay. We call that divided Rome. So it's not like there was no Rome after 476. It's the Roman Empire wasn't conquered by a new empire, but dissolved. It fizzled. It broke into 10 component parts. I want to show you the, the map of that, but I have neglected to include that in my... Oh, no, here it is. I'm going to put it right there. I just had to skip ahead a few slides. That's the 10 divisions of the Western Roman Empire. So you've got ancient Rome there in Italy falling prey to the, um, to the 10 barbarian tribes, to the, to the tribes of what we now call the nations of Western Europe, many of them, most of them. Can I show you some pretty cool pictures a friend of mine took? This is in Nuremberg, Nuremberg Germany the capital of Protestantism in the 1500s, in the 16th century. And as you enter this building, which is known as the capital of Protestantism, what do you see above the doorways? Are, it's kind of hard to see, but are you seeing four, four different the beasts? beasts? Yeah, are you seeing the four beasts? Let's go back. Let's do it again. That's a lion with eagle's wings, isn't it? And what does the headdress and the, and, the, and the beard look, and what does that look like if you see the imagery of ancient empires? That looks distinctly Babylonian. Yeah, it does. So these guys knew 500 years ago. We're not discovering something new here. Yeah. And the bear with three ribs in his mouth, it's hard to see the ribs. They got these metal things sticking out, meant to be ribs. And of course, the Persian headdress. Yep. That's the Persians. So Babylon. 
Medo-Persia. And then the four heads, you saw the four heads, Greece, with the Greek looking, and that could be a depiction of Alexander and, and, uh, and, and Cyrus and, and, and um, Nebuchadnezzar, or just, just, just generals. They, they certainly look the part. That guy looks Greek. He looks Persian. They even get the, they even get the facial features right. Uh, and then the last one is a terrible beast. Again, how do you make the terrible beast? It kind of looks like a cow. But anyway, he's got ten horns and Roman regalia. Isn't that something? These guys knew. This is, this is pretty cool to see. Now let's go to, you, you are in the session, Antichrist power rising. So what we're going to see next is that very thing, the little horn. Verse 8. I was considering the horns. Which horns was he considering? The ten. So he was thinking about those ten, and there was another horn, a little one. I'm in verse 8. And I want you to collect in your mind little identifiers, little characteristics of this power. And we're going to list them on the screen so we can know who this power is upon the earth. So it's little. And it is coming up among them among the ten kingdoms of Western Europe, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. There's another fact. And there in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words, or if you go to Revelation 13 where it identifies this same power, blasphemous words, pompous, blasphemous words. Jump over to verse 23. Thus the angel said to Daniel in interpreting this vision, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. By the way, the Roman Empire ruled from England to India. That's how vast its empire was. It's the whole, the whole world up to basically the Himalayans and the Atlantic Ocean. And the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. So we're reviewing there. The fourth kingdom is Rome, followed by the ten kingdoms that arise after the Roman Empire. Now the rest of verse 24 is going to give us more details about this little horn. And another shall arise after them. After when? When did the ten kingdoms arise? When did Rome divide into ten? 476 A.D. So it's going to be uh, this little horn will arise after that. He shall be different from the first ones. He shall subdue three kings. Verse 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. So it's repeating some of the things from earlier. You know, he shall subdue three kings was stated earlier as he will pluck up three horns. And he will say pompous words against the Most High. Earlier it was just pompous words, but now you're noticing it's pompous words against the Most High. So that's why... John the Revelator in chapter 13 calls the beast power blasphemous. Going on, he shall intend to change times and law. Now, why would this be noteworthy? Doesn't every new monarch change the laws? Every, every new king, when he comes to power, makes changes in the laws. So he's speaking pompous words against whom? Against the Most High. Whose law is he going to be going after? Yeah, he's not just changing the laws of the previous king. That wouldn't even be worth mentioning. It's in the context of blasphemous changes. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. A time and times and half a time. We'll come back to that. You're like, what does that mean? A time and times and half a time. Well, I'll give you a clue. When, when Nebuchadnezzar was told you're going to be cast out into the wilderness, it says seven times will pass over you, which meant seven years for him. So we're going to come back to a time, times, and half a time in a moment. 
But shall we make the list? You, you probably got this list, but I'll put it up on the screen too. We are looking, when we, when we want to say, who is the beast power, the little horn power, the antichrist power, the man of sin, the lawless one? Who is this? We need to find a kingdom that is small and that arises in Western Europe, because it said among the ten horns, the ten kingdoms of divided Rome. And then we have a time sequence as well that it's going to arise after 476. And you can probably assume pretty, pretty soon after 476, because each time in Daniel's prophecies, it's one thing, then the next, then the next, then the next, then the next. So it's not like, well, we're just going to hit pause on this and he's going to come, you know, 2,000 years later. It's the Antichrist is going to come and uproot three of these on his rise, plucks up three horns, so he will subdue three kings. He's going to have eyes and mouth of a man. So when you think of this power, you will think of that it's got a, a man with, a, with eyes and a mouth and a mouth that's saying religious things? Cue also our other text from 2 Thessalonians 2, son of perdition, in the place of Christ. Um, he, they went out from us, but were not of us. So they wear that Christian veneer, but the message is not biblical. So it's going to be religious and pompous words, great words and blasphemies. And also it will be a persecuting power. It's going to persecute the saints. The saints shall be given into his hand for a specific period of time, a time, times, and half a time. And also he will think to change times and laws. So that's a pretty good list. We could go to the other texts and add a few more like we were just talking about. We'll just keep those in the back, in the back of our brain as we look at these ones from Daniel 7. Can we go to that one? Because I told you I'd explain this. You, you can actually figure this out. You don't need me to explain it. If seven times for Nebuchadnezzar, a few chapters earlier, was seven years, what is a time? One year. One year. So a time would be one year. Times is an un, unspecified plurality. And in ancient languages, if it was a plurality that's not stated, like, 42 or 6, you know, plural meaning more than one. If it's an unstated plurality, the assumption would be that it is two. A time, times, so how many is that then so far? Three. And half a time, three and a half. Now what's cool about this is if you're like, well, I'm not sure about that unstated plurality thing. Go to Revelation 13 and 12, and you'll see this same time period mentioned several times. Sometimes it's referred to as 42 months. Anybody doing the math in their head right now? 42 months is three and a half years. It says that this power will rule for that long in Revelation 13 and in Revelation 12. It also refers to it in Revelation 12 and 13 as 1,260 days. Now, that might make the record skip in your math brain right now because you're going, wait a minute, 365 plus 365 plus 365 plus half of 365 doesn't equal 1,260. You've got to go by the Jewish year, 360-day year. Do the math, 360, 360, 360, and half of 360, you get 1,260. So there you have it, a year, two years, and half a year, one plus two plus a half equals 3.5, or three and a half years, 42 months, or 1,260 days. So that's how long he's going to rule for. Now, by the way, was everybody here the first night when we looked at Daniel 9 and we saw the exact timing of the Messiah's first coming predicted with precision? Do you remember it was a 483 days in the future the Messiah will come? And you, Israel, you Jews, have 490 days to repent as a nation, have revival, move all your people back to Jerusalem, rebuild the wall and the temple, restart worship services, all of which cannot be accomplished in a year and a half, 490 days. So we saw two texts in the Bible. I'll bring them up in just a second again in Ezekiel 
and in, in the Torah, both of which, in Numbers, both of which say a day corresponds to a year. So we saw Jesus came 483 years. He was anointed. He was the Messiah. 483 years from the starting point of that prophecy. So it worked. Same thing here. We're going to want to look for a 1,260 year period of time, perhaps. So as we look at just the first three, secular history leaves only one option for who the biblical antichrist power is. It is not a matter of one's religious preferences or allegiances or alliances, one's opinion, what I want to be true, what I don't want to be. I got to remove all of that and be objective. And you can go to secular historians and say, hey, could you tell me what power was a small, territorially small entity that arose in Western Europe after 476 A.D. And just those three narrows it down to only one political entity, religio-political entity. We'll get to the other ones, but without having to go to some of those other ones which introduce theological implications here, can you simply on a secular level, on an objective historical level, say, I know what power arose after 476 A.D. amongst the ten kingdoms of divided Rome, in other words, Western Europe, and uprooted three kingdoms in its rise to power. By the way, before you say it, in the 1500s, the 1600s, the 1700s, through the development of Bible-believing Christianity as the Bible was spread through the common languages of German and English and then went global in the 1800s. It was, this was a universally understood fact of history. Today, it's hard. You can see I'm kind of like giving us some time to take this in before we go forward because this is a heavy reality for us today. Back then... I could spend 45 minutes just quoting from all of the reformers and all of the Christian theologians and thinkers of those four centuries. Until the last hundred years, we've kind of gotten off track on some different views of some things. But back then, this was, they'd be like, well, what do you mean? Everybody knows that. They've got their four kingdoms right up there on the, on the entryway, right? So what power arose upon the earth? at that time. Can you say it? The Vatican. Vatican City, or in other words, the papacy, the Roman church state, geographically small, arose after 476 AD as a political entity. The Bishop of Rome had been around religiously, of course, but 538 AD is, is a few decades after 476 AD, right? 538 AD, I think you heard this Friday night, it was when the last of the three barbarian tribes was uprooted by the Bishop of Rome's military, Justinian, the emperor's military, he was his ally, um, defeated the last of the three remaining tribes that was resisting papal supremacy. When I say papal, I mean that which relates to the pope. So um, after 476, small, in Western Europe, but how about did it rule for 1,260 days or 1,260 years? There's the text that I mentioned from Numbers and Ezekiel. Let's look to years and see if this works out. By the way, what I'm about to show you, in the decades leading up to this date, there were Christian Bible scholars and prophecy students who were predicting the fall of papal Rome, the fall of the Vatican, in the coming years, they said, we're getting to the end of the period of time allotted to this power to have political rule. And that year was, well, has anybody done the math? Because I said that this power acquired its supremacy after defeating the three in 538, 538 A.D. Oh, man, Brother Ritzema, you're having us do a lot of math tonight. <laughs> 538 A.D. plus 1,260. Help each other out. Get your calculator out. What is it? 1,798, right? We call that 1798. 
Did something happen in 1798? Yeah, not just something. A massive cataclysmic event for Papal Rome happened in 1798. Napoleon was marching across Europe. His general Berthier marches right into the Vatican, takes the Pope captive. By the way, in Revelation 13, it says specifically that he who leads them ca into captivity will go into captivity. So it names the captivity of the Pope 2,000 years almost, 1,800 years before, 1,700 years before the event in Revelation 13. Yeah, it's unbelievable. So here you have the fall of the power known as Vatican City. I mentioned that he subdued three kings, papal power and emperor Justinian, the, the vestigial Roman em emperor, subdues the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. You heard that Friday night. And then, of course, the Pope himself is a very prominent man that makes you think of a man at the head, a little horn with a man's eyes and face, a religious power that speaks great... Okay, let's go to, let's go to this one. Speaks great words and blasphemy. So I said there are some theological implications here. And I want to go solely on the biblical, the biblical definition of blasphemy. And I want to be super, super clear that a person who happens to be a Catholic is not the target of this prophecy in the Bible. This is about a power, a kingdom, okay? So this isn't about you if you're Catholic. So I should have said that earlier because this could have been a shocking last seven or eight minutes since we had the revelation moment. Um, I love all people. You love all people. I know that goes without saying, but every person, whatever faith, whatever religious, racial, ethnic background is we are all his offspring, it says in the book of Acts, and God loves every person and desires all to come to a knowledge of the truth of salvation through Jesus Christ. So let's talk about not this system, not about, not about people, but about systems. Does this system engage in great words and pompous words and blasphemies? What is the biblical definition of blasphemy? The Jews answered Jesus saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. So if a mere man were to claim to be in the position of God, in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, 2 Thessalonians 2, then that would be biblically defined as blasphemy. Here's a statement from ex cathedra. That means it's supposedly infallible, not to be reversed. It's something that if a pope says it, it is dogma. Pope Leo XIII said, The supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. Union of minds, therefore, requires, together with a perfect accord in the one faith, complete submission and obedience of the will is required. You must completely submit and obey your will to God, to Jesus, to the church and the Roman pontiff, as to God himself. He said, I am to be, I am to be obeyed as God himself. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. That would be the de biblical definition of blasphemy. A man placing himself, oh, isn't that interesting? What is the definition of Antichrist? In the place of Christ. Um, there's enough hate and division in our world today. Are, are you noticing this? Yes. Uh, we don't need more of that. No. Don't use these truths to throw them at, you're blasphemous. That's not the intention here. We're simply doing a Bible study, seeing what the Bible says. Jesus always spoke the truth. We don't hold back like, well, this is not a politically correct truth, so we better not believe it. Well, no, that's not acceptable either. Jesus was filled with grace and truth. 100% truth, 100% grace. And not like 50-50, 100 and 100. And we can be the same. And we're all imperfect. I'm an imperfect medium. Let God's word speak. But um, if someone frankly, is oppressed by doctrines and beliefs and a system that tells them that salvation comes through works and sacraments and not through grace, not through faith, that forgiveness comes through a priest, not through Christ, and that truth comes through tradition rather than freedom and knowing it's the word of God, not the shifting sands of man's opinion. Then you allow the Holy Spirit filled with grace and truth to fill the heart with that truth, to liberate us from that oppressive darkness upon us. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who, can, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? There's a second biblical definition of blasphemy. One, to take on divine prerogatives. 
obey me as God. I hold the place of God. Second one is to claim to forgive sins. Now, Jesus had the right to claim to forgive sins because he was God. He was the son of God. He had divinity. Yet the priests of the Roman system claim in the words ego te absolvo, they claim to be absolving and dispensing the forgiveness. Ego means I. I absolve you of your sins. How can a priest forgive sins? Catholic answers. The priest stands in the place of Christ to declare the sinner forgiven. In the place of. I know that term from our dictionary definition on the first slide. It is antichrist. We say, they say we are the vicars of Christ, which is saying we are in the place of Christ, which is saying the definition of antichrist. The Bible says something beautiful and liberating. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. We go to God for forgiveness through Jesus Christ. I come to the Father through Jesus, his Son, who gives me the glory, who gives him the glory, great things he has done, Fanny Crosby. 1 Peter 2, verse 5 also tells us something pretty exciting. It said, you know how there was a priesthood in the Old Testament, the Levites? Is there a priesthood in the New Testament anywhere? It's a trick question. <laughs> he, he got it. I thought you were going to be like, no, no, there's no more priesthood. Correct. But there is. It says, 1 Peter 2, verse 5, you, all believers, all saints, all Christians, every person who believes in Jesus Christ, right. you are the priesthood, it says in the Bible. Amen. Revelation says it three times, by the way. There's a cool repetition, exclamation point for you. Do you want the text? 1, verse 6, 5, verse 10. There's Revelation 1, verse 6, Revelation 5, verse 10. In Revelation 20, verse 16, three times repeated that we are a priesthood. Now, this is what they claim uh, in, their, in, their, um, in their liturgies, in the Mass, is happening during this, this period of turning the bread and the wine into the blood and body of Jesus and, and dispensing this as the merits of salvation through the sacraments of the church. When the priest announces, this is from Catholic authority, Reverend O'Brien, John Anthony O'Brien. When the priest announces the tremendous words of consecration upon the elements, he reaches up into the heavens, brings Christ down from his throne, and places him upon our altar to be offered up again as the victim for the sins of man. I know this is not enjoyable to hear and read, but we have to understand what the darkness and deception is. The light will appear all the more beautiful in reaction and in contrast. It is a power greater than that of saints. What is the power? To reach up to the throne of God, take Jesus off his throne, and make him a victim to be offered up again upon our altar. It is a power greater than that of saints and angels, greater than that of seraphim and cherubim. The priest brings Christ down from heaven and renders him present on our altar as the eternal victim for the sins of man. Not once, but a thousand times! Exclamation point. The priest speaks, and lo, Christ, the eternal and omnipotent God, bows his head in humble obedience to the priest's command. You see, the word blasphemy is not hyperbole. It is not exaggeration. The prophecy said it would be a blasphemous power. And indeed, we read it. Persecutes the saints. During the Dark Ages, the Vatican was responsible for the deaths of multiplied millions of people. Depending on what you read in the history, it could be as many as 120 million people were put to death by this power because they did not line up with the church's doctrines and teachings and traditions and power. They didn't conform. Trage tragedies like the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre are a matter of the historical record in France. And some of my lineage actually dates from the Huguenots of France who fled France in reaction to that persecution to the free nation of the Netherlands, later came to America. You can go to Europe and stand in the very spot where faithful saints were burnt at the stake. In England, by the way, by a Protestant government, um, it's not... This, this power doesn't have a monopoly on genocide. Communist governments, atheistic governments, you get, a, you, you get democides all over the place. But certainly this is part of the historical record. Changing times and laws. Now, I, I like how Daniel puts it. He says he would think to change times and laws. Can you change God's law? No. 
no. Can you go up into heaven and drag Jesus off his throne and, and crucify him a thousand times on an altar? No. They think to do these things. But you can't change God's law. Well, here's the thinking to do it. You can go to Vatican.va in 2024. You can go to the internet, to the Vatican's own website, and read the Ten Commandments as they appear on the Vatican website. Do you know your Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before me is the first commandment, right? What is the second commandment? Thou shalt not make for thyself any graven image. Okay, so let's go to the second commandment on Vatican.va. Wait a minute. That's the third commandment. It is. The, we just omitted the second commandment there. Mm -hmm. Is it going to appear later? Well, let's keep going. Sabbath commandment is in the three spot, not four. Honor your father and mother is in the fourth spot, not the fifth. Thou shalt not kill is in the fifth spot, not the sixth. Adultery, sixth, not seventh. No stealing, seventh, not eighth. Don't lie is in the eighth, not the ninth. So what is it, nine commandments? Well, to, to retain the number at ten, there are two commandments devoted to coveting. Wow. So you get two for one there, but you just got rid of commandment number two. You can't just do that. You can't just say, we're going to eliminate one of the commandments of God. Um, by the way, why would that be one of the ones that gets uh, monkeyed with here? Because in the Roman church, the Roman system, it was basically on the heels of pagan Rome, papal Rome baptized a lot of the paganism of the Roman Empire. Case in point, the statue of Jupiter. Famous, famous statue. Now, you might have looked at that and you'd be like, why did Brother Ritzema just call that Jupiter? I know that as St. Peter in St. Peter's Basilica. And they bow before the statue and kiss his feet thousands of times to the point where the metal is worn down. This, before it was Peter, was Jupiter, the, god, the Roman god Jupiter. Enough said on that. We're going to run out of time here. I want to give you the good news. Do you remember how Daniel 2 ended? Daniel 2 did not end with the kingdoms of this world and their darkness and persecution and deceptions. Daniel 2 ended with the rock that hits the statue and God wins and his kingdom fills the whole earth. Now before I read Daniel 7's rendition of that, do you understand now why in the 3rd century, I believe it was, the 200s, both Tertullian and was it Hippolytus? Dr. Tim can correct me on that. He had the two quotes from those two early Christians. They were living during the Roman Empire. They were students of both Daniel 2 and 7. And they both said, based on what Paul wrote in the New Testament, he says there is a, there is a, 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 a hedge that is protecting from the rise of the great apostasy. And when that is taken away, then the great apostasy will happen. So Tertullian and Hippolytus said, well, I'm probably pronouncing their Roman names wrong, but anyway. They said, we know that this persecuting pagan Roman empire, as terrible as it is for the martyrs of Christendom, who are being thrown into the arena, destroyed and ravaged by lions, who are being burned at Nero's feasts as burning Roman candles, who are being tortured, who are being thrown animal skins upon them to be devoured. As bad as pagan Rome is, it's actually preventing the worst thing that's coming, the persecution of the Antichrist power, which will come next. They knew that when Rome fell, or when Rome was to be divided, not conquered, that out of that division would come this power, and they feared it. They prayed for the continued success of the Roman Empire. Isn't that amazing? Because they knew what was coming next, had a lot more ink devoted to it in Daniel 7 in terms of persecuting the saints and being blasphemous. But that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is Christ's kingdom. And the kingdom and dominion, this is verse 27, the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the saints of the Most High, to the people, to the saints, all of you. You are the saints of the Most High. 
and his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Does that remind you of Daniel 8, when Daniel was troubled by that 2,300-year vision? Yeah. This, we're now filling in the gaps. Daniel 2 introduces those five steps to be followed by Christ's coming. But Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, that should say Daniel 7 and 8, introduce two more phases that precede Christ's coming. Revelation 13 is going to introduce one final phase. And this is what we're in the midst of right now. I'll get down, I, I won't spill the beans on that. But basically, Daniel 7 just told us that after divided Rome, we should expect a 1,260-year period of papal dominance and persecution of Bible-believing Christians, which happened. And then, beginning in 1844, the heavenly judgment, the heavenly sanctuary cleansing would begin prior to the second coming of Jesus. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, is here already. We're getting close. I will leave it there for tonight. So in these last days, for such a time as this, the final question is, in Revelation 13 and throughout, the whole great controversy, the question has been, whom will we worship? Whom will we obey? Satan wants worship to himself. He wants obedience from his false counterfeits. And you have now seen, when I was referring to this Antichrist, that is the lawless one, the lawless one, the lawless one against God's law. This Antichrist's power who would think to change times and law, this Antichrist power, who in Revelation 13 is receiving the worship and thus the dragon is receiving the worship, Satan's propped up Christian-looking entity and power is that which is the counterfeit of God's true Bible-believing people. Now I want to give one last comment on that. Brother Ritzmer, are you saying people in this system or that are all, you know, in hell and all that? I, I want to suspend questions like that. That is not for our purposes to dictate and determine. But I will say this, and I'm going to show you this later. You have to take my word for it now. You can study in Revelation 17 on your own time. Revelation 17 describes this power as uh, the symbolism is called Babylon. It's a woman called Babylon. And you know what God announces to the people in Babylon, in the systems of deception? He says, come out of her, my people. Notice those words, my people. This is not another way to divide and, and condemn and to be on a superior plane over somebody else. This is a way to bring light and truth and freedom in Christ to all. God has his people in every system, in every place in the world. I mean, you'll go to places of, they've never heard, had a Bible. And the leader of that tribe will say, we've received dreams and the shining one told us that the people with the black book would be coming. Tell us more. They didn't know the name of Jesus even. God says, my people are all over and I'm calling them in. Come home, come home. <laughs> Ye who are weary, come home. Do you know the hymn? Yeah. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling you. No matter what religious background you have, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Have we not? Yes. Nobody is better than anybody else because of what cultural religious background we have. Remember that and go with the peace that transcends all understanding that you know your sins are forgiven by Christ. When you go to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for that truth as it is in Jesus. Give us your peace now that transcends all understanding and give us that salvation you offer to freely give, not through a system, but through a man, one mediator, Jesus Christ. We embrace him as our Lord and Savior. We want to seek to obey and worship you alone not render our will 
unto a system that claims to be in your place. We know you are God alone, and we love you for it. And we love our neighbor as ourself. Help us to do that in, in better ways than we've done before, to reach out to all those around us, to serve, to bless, to uplift, to be willing to sacrifice ourselves for our fellow man, no matter who they are, where they're from. In Jesus' name, amen.